Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Ham Nation is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Ham Nation is brought to you by ICOM. For more information, visit icomamerica.com slash ham nation. And by DX Engineering. DX Engineering offers practically everything you need to outfit your shack, plus the fastest shipping in the industry. In-stock items ship the same day, Monday through Friday, until 10 p.m. Eastern. For more information, visit dxengineering.com slash ham nation. This is Ham Nation, episode 256 for July 13th, 2016. Zappa does Zappa. Good evening, everybody. It's K9EID. I'm Bob Heil, and I'm back home in the Ozarks, finally. After a little run, we've been out with Dweezil. How many people know who Dweezil is? <laughs> Dweezil's a cool old guy. His father was Frank Zappa, and he's out playing. Uh, his tour is... Um, Zappa plays Zappa, and he's playing his father's music, and it's just, it's just, you know, the stuff was really way out there in the 70s. Well, it's still out there. But Dweezil's such a neat guy. I'll have to bring some pictures of him next time. But anyway, we have so much to do here. I'm telling you, we got videos and videos and videos, and we're so glad to have you. Dale, how are you doing? You got a lot of videos, don't you? Uh, we're doing pretty good, Bob. I had a really good weekend, the 4th of July weekend, got to... Uh, uh, get a clean sweep on the 13 Colonies event and the uh, two uh, bonus stations. That was uh, a lot of fun. And uh, the videos came through for us uh, this time on the field days. We actually got six in, uh, two from uh, some regular contributors and uh, four more. So I think everybody will enjoy looking at uh, everybody else uh, having fun on uh, field day tonight. Bob, go ahead. <laughs> Look forward to that. And uh, George, you got uh, you've got some great videos from Randy, and I think he's uh, furthering the audio mixer. Is that right, George? I think he's actually uh, connecting at this time and checking it out. So we'll have a look at that a little later. Uh, I'll also uh, tell you where you can uh, go check out my field day video. We finally got that edited and posted. And uh, we'll we'll give away a couple of things as well. Yeah, lots of stuff. And uh, Gordo, you got some really cool uh, short shots too uh, from Costa Mesa. Uh, we do, and uh, no Pokemon Go for hams. The hams have a modern version of Pokemon Go. More about that in a few minutes. Back to you, Bob. Oh, that's great. Well, I'm so excited to be back. Uh, and number one, I miss all you guys and gals and when I'm out on the road. And it's amazing how many people I run into that uh, are viewers of the show. It's just really, really amazing. I get to leave here next week. Uh, I won't be here next Wednesday because I'm heading out to West Shum's farm. West Shum was the great man that brought single sideband to amateur radio and he he had the company central electronics and that little piece of gear that you see behind me every week that i built from a kit in 1958 i was one of his products and uh, i i really admired the man i was very fortunate to be able to spend field day with him a couple years ago but every year Nick Tusa, who was, uh, I guess, a student of his, he worked in his plan as a young man, and he's, he's got all the parts and all that, and he fixes all this. He's put this together again. This is the fourth annual uh, of the field day uh, operation, but we're not doing it on field day. We're doing it in July, July 23rd, and I want everybody to know what's going on with that particular deal. Let me get this up here so you can see it all. You want to go see uh, the uh, the operation down there. Uh, it's in uh, Jonesboro, Tennessee, which is in eastern Tennessee. Uh, 
And it's a marvelous, beautiful place. And it actually is his home. And his daughter and son-in-law have made it into a bed and breakfast. And it's just gorgeous. And here's some shots of it that I took when I was there last time. Uh, this is uh, West Shum's farm, and they call it Storybook Farms. And oh my goodness, is this beautiful. And you guys want to take advantage of being able to go there. And it just, it's just gorgeous. Look at this shot. And what we get to do is they invite us down, and you can come along. And what we get to do is set up out in the field, and it makes it a really good field day site, so to speak. Here's what happens. This was um, uh, two years ago. No, this was last year. They put up this great tent. <laughs> I, I don't know of any field day that's got a chandelier in a tent. What do you think, George? Look at that. <laughs> wow. No, we did, I mean, we did not have one. You, yeah, I don't know anybody that did, but they do. And uh, they bring in all these vintage radios. And uh, what's so cool about it this year is Nick Tusa has found what it was named the Ivanhoe. The Ivanhoe was a transceiver, an AM transceiver that West Shum Central Electronics, they built one of them, but it never hit the market. Well, they found it, and it's going to be at Storybook Farms. And uh, you guys and gals want to come and, and, and help us. We'll put up antennas and uh, just do a regular field day. You'll be able to work us. I'll give you some information about that in a minute. And here we were, Nick and I, uh, that was uh, two years ago. But we're operating the gear from West Shum. That's his personal uh, gear, and, and, and just, it was just so much fun. But um, what you want to do is contact Nick. Here's the information to contact Nick and um, get in on this. Uh, it's down in Jonesboro, Tennessee, the eastern part of Tennessee, way out there. We're going to have workshops. There'll be, uh, uh, oh, there's about 10 of them. And, and they're going to be on really cool things uh, like how uh, the GE single sideband junior, uh, it ignited ham radio sideband and uh, how to tame your uh, central electronics 458 VFO. And uh, Mike Bond's going to be there, K7 uh, a KG7 TR, he homebrew stuff that you, you just won't believe. I'll have some pictures for you. But there's just all of these things all day, all types of things about uh, various pieces of old gear, new gear, and I'm going to be doing one on audio. But it starts on Saturday. That's, uh, that's the start date. And I'm going in on Friday. A lot of us are going in on Friday. And uh, you'll want to come down and have fun with us on Friday uh, also. But 8 a.m. on Saturday, and we'll be on these frequencies. You want to copy this down, 14292. And then it'll, it'll be up in there somewhere so we don't mess up anybody's nets. So uh, that that's basically where you'll find us on 20 meters and uh, then at night, we're going to be on 7260, somewhere around in there, or 3870. Now, most all this will be on AM, but there will be some sideband also. So look for us. And it'll be either my call, K9EID, or it'll be Nick. Uh, and and uh, K5EF is his call. So uh, I hope you guys can make it. With, it. It's just an incredible thing. And maybe I get too overly excited about it, but I'm too overly excited about this whole hobby. And this is where it started for single sideband was at West Shum's place. And we get to go there and spend a weekend. And I want you to come along. So get all the Nick and uh, make it happen. And we'll, um, we'll tell you more about it. I'll get you some nice pictures and video and all that because... Um, 
going to video all this stuff. And I hope to see some of you there. But uh, in the meantime, I will um, we'll be on air a little bit this week and um, making it happen. So that's the story from here about the weekend in Jonesboro, Tennessee. And I hope you get to join us. So, uh, Gordo, I wish you could be there. This is your kind of thing, man. But uh, you're on the opposite side of the country. <laughs> But what's going on in your world? I know you got a whole bunch of nice things, so let's see what you got, Gordo. Roger that, and we'll try and tune you in this weekend. This weekend, our local candy store is having a ham jam, so uh, we'll try and uh, dial in some double side band. And thanks to Roy, AC2 Golf Sierra. Roy's the one that does the Kings County Radio Club so now what that he gives to uh, brand new hams that passed the test. He is a classic writer. And for those of you in New York City, you've got to read his fun comments about the N2ROW. You know, that's your UHF Times Square repeater. It's a fun one. Well, perfect timing tonight, Bob, in that uh, Leo and team prior to this show, we're talking about Pokemon Go. Well, we want to talk a little bit about the ham radio version that is not necessarily a game. So, Brian, if you don't mind, let's go to that first short shot. And um, this is developed by a ham. And what they are are small 222 megahertz transmitters. And that is a single sideband with a very tight filter receiver. And once the transmitters are turned on, this is the kind of noise that you're going to pick up when you are trying to locate where that little transmitter is with your receiver. So let's take a look and see what makes this a Pokemon Go even great for hams. First of all, this is a ham radio transmitter that goes on your pal, your uh, fuzz ball or fur ball or uh, hair ball or whatever kind of uh, uh, pet you may have or mom and dad that wander around or little kids. And they're in the ham band. So this is a ham radio setup. Now, they have different versions for the public that are part 15, but this is a little bit more powerful on the ham radio 222 band. The little pulses are picked up by this. It's about $250 receiver. And let me tell you, this receiver, uh, I think it's triple conversion. It has all sorts of very tight filters, and it's picking up a CW response. And it has 50 channels because you could load yourself up with 50 individual uh, channel uh, transmitters, each one on a separate frequency. And the receiver comes with an Adcock array antenna, and it is quite narrow in its reception in the forward direction of the tag that you're trying to tune in. And this whole little tra receiver actually works on a 9-volt battery or you can power it uh, with a external source and you can power it with an external antenna, even a big beam antenna that you could rotate on the roof. So the whole idea is to look at signal strength, keep adding attenuation and up to two or three or four blocks away or out in the open up to a half to a mile away, you can begin to home in on the little tag that is making this little tiny noise because that is going to be your furry pal that got away during the 4th of July. And, oh, what a sad stories I hear of hams who have lost their pets. They could be maybe a block away and you could pick them up. Or you could drive to your animal shelter and know even before going in whether or not your pet is there. This is great for ham radio at field day, wanting to uh, entertain hams into something new called tea hunting. And uh, they get the hang of it quick. This same company run by Spence Porter, who is a ham called ComSpec, uh, they make uh, higher power transmitters for public safety or emergency medical use. So this is just the beginning. Ours are about two milliwatts and uh, the uh, transmitter goes about uh, two to three uh, blocks away downtown. That would be the top one or even further uh, if you have a external antenna on it. Now, the little uh, kid here has uh, the uh, tag, doesn't even know it's there, and the tag uses threads in the collar 
for added range, and he's on 222 megahertz. Here's the actual transmitter, and they play for about 40 days continuously, uh, making uh, that little uh, beep sound that you hear here. And uh, the transmitters um, are um, almost uh, waterproof. And this little transmitter fits, uh, there's the contact side. And it fits into the holder that has a pickup tag, and that's for the antenna. And um, each transmitter has its own individual channel. And uh, once you put the uh, very, very common um, uh, lithium uh, battery in, and they're not very expensive, it is a CR2032. You can buy them anywhere, drugstores, you name it. This battery will keep the transmitter ticking for about 40 days. So you drop the battery in, you, you put on the cover, and you are ready to roll. Now, these are somewhat waterproof. They are not submersible, but in the rain, if you got it on your dog or whatever, it will continue to keep out the uh, water. And uh, we use this with a Coast Guard auxiliary, uh, one of our little auxiliary uh, sniffing dogs that looks for contraband. Uh, this particular uh, pooch has a tag on. So if he gets away, we can find him very, very easily. There's a cat getting ready for field day coiled up on RG8U. And uh, that uh, cat doesn't even know the tag is there. And one time we found him two or three blocks away. And uh, even the military has uh, taken a look at these. And uh, so you're finding that the tags are showing up everywhere. But remember, the ham radio tags are for hams because the transmitter is uh, on the air on ham channels. This is great for kids to get them involved in uh, tea hunting. And kids really get a big kick out of it. I don't know if it'll be equal to Pokemon Go, but these kids had a great time finding all five transmitters on five different channels. So if you're looking for something to get the kids interested, there you go. Each transmitter runs a couple uh, milliwatts out, and this one is with a longer antenna. You see it all coiled up there. So if you had a horse or a big animal, you could put it on there. And what I do is I bury the transmitters when I'm doing uh, demos with ham radio sets that uh, someone from the outside uh, might want to uh, take for a ride. Uh, here uh, we have the sets uh, ready to go. It looks like a normal ham radio. That's our quartz best radio, the ICOM uh, 9100. But inside that radio is the ticker. And if I lose track of that radio, I turn on... Um, I turn on my receiver, and I'm able to very easily, with the Adcock antenna, uh, correction, with the Moxon antenna, be able to find it. And by the way, uh, this uh, receiver can hook up into all sorts of great direction finding, small little 222 beams. Yes, if you have a problem of uh, losing uh, uh, your uh, vehicle that is airborne, uh, or if you have a rocket or a balloon launch, Wow, you can see it all the way to altitude. And then as you get within a mile or so with an outside antenna, you can begin to find out which cornfield has your uh, balloon that made the ascent. So uh, while the cats uh, may not uh, really appreciate uh, having this hung around their neck to be found, um, they don't even know that uh, they are uh, wearing it. So again, here is the device and uh, the ComSpec uh, receiver uh, is uh, part of it, and it's com-spec.com to look up the specifications. It's on the 222 band, and if you're looking for the next degree up from having fun with Pokemon Go, you may want to consider these little ticker tags that have uh, great use for pets, for uh, Alzheimer patients, uh, for uh, uh, those in search and rescue, Boy Scout groups, each has their own little transmitter. If you lose a scout, uh, figure out what channel he's on, and you'll be able to find him up to about a half to one mile away out in the open. Down on the flatlands in the big cities, we get about two or three blocks with the 222 megahertz tags. So I love them, and if you lost a pet during the 4th of July a couple weeks ago, uh, you'd find them if they had the tag on.
So that's the story here. And speaking of stories, let's now take a look with Don's Newsline. From Amateur Radio Newsline Report number 2019, these are the Ham Nation headlines for Wednesday, July 13th, 2016. Amateur Electronic Supply, the second largest ham radio retailer in the U.S., is closing. Amateur Electronic Supply, the second largest ham radio dealer in the United States, is closing. The Milwaukee-based seller plans to shut its doors at the end of the month after more than 50 years of serving the amateur radio community. Amateur Electronic Supply has four locations. Its corporate headquarters in Milwaukee, the Cleveland area, Las Vegas, and Orlando, Florida. The business began as a venture by then 18-year-old Terry Sturman, W9DIA, in Milwaukee in 1957. It was founded as Amateur Electronic Supply, LLC, in 1998. Terry Sturman became a silent key in 1999. That's Paul Brown, WD9GCO reporting. Marking the National Park Centennial, one group of Washington, D.C. area hams recently elected themselves to the White House. Uh, that is to say, they elected to operate there on the grounds. If your goal is to get to the White House in an election year, it usually means a lot of campaigning, debating, shaking hands, and expensive television ads. Unless you happen to be the Hack DC Amateur Radio Club in Washington, DC, then all you need is a portable radio, a small antenna, and permission. They recently operated from the White House grounds, which is an actual national park. I recently spoke with Don Jones, K6ZO, who said they had a whole lot of fun. We had so much fun that we're going to come back on the 25th of uh, August for a full-blown day, which is August 25th is the day that the National Park celebrates their 100th anniversary. Jones said that for the short time they were on the air this first time, they made quite a few contacts. We were on um, a 20-meter CW mainly, and we were there doing a demonstration for about 30 minutes, and we made 22 contacts. We had a special call sign, Whiskey 3 Hotel for White House. Propagation was real good. They planned to return, but next time they want it to be much bigger. We just slid in and out with a backpack and a portable station, but we're going to find out from the national parks what we need to do because we want to set up like a tent, a banner, sort of celebrate the centennial with the uh, park service. If you're in the Washington, D.C. area and want to find out more about the club, visit the website at hacdc.org and listen for them to be on the air again this August. For Amateur Radio Newsline, I'm Paul Brown, WD9GCO. Boy Scouts on the air as K2BSA aren't just operating, they're upgrading. This week in Radio Scouting, we have three scout camps on the air as K2BSA, an upcoming Radio Scout Net, and the Scout Loan Stations are being upgraded. Our Portable Zero station is still active at Camp Geiger in St. Joseph, Missouri and will continue to be through July 22nd. Our Portable 5 station at the Philmont Scout Ranch continues as well in New Mexico through September 1st. Finally, our Portable 8 station at Camp Wynadot in Wakeman, Ohio will continue to be active on Wednesdays through July 21st. Chris Overby, KB5UBT, has volunteered to host a monthly radio scouting net on the second Thursday of every month. His first net will be at 10 p.m. Central Time, Thursday, July 14th, which is also 0300 UTC Friday, July 15th. Frequency is 7.190 MHz, plus or minus the QRM. Chris is located in the Dallas, Texas area. ICOM America has provided 10 complete stations for loan to local councils since 2012. They are now in the process of updating their kits, replacing the IC7200 with the new IC7300. With its touchscreen and pan adapter display, it meets scouts where they live, with their smartphone. Please help support this activity and others involving youth and amateur radio by working and spotting them on the air and online. For more information on K2BSA and radio scouting, please visit k2bsa.net. For Amateur Radio Newsline and the K2BSA Amateur Radio Association, this is Bill Stearns, NE4RD. And that's all from the Amateur Radio Newsline, your independent source for amateur radio news for four decades and counting at www.arnewsline.org. With Paul Brown, WD9GCO, Bill Stearns, NE4RD, Karen Eve Murray, KD2GUT at the news desk in New York, and our news team across the globe. I'm Don Wilbanks, AE5DW73. We'll see you next time here on Ham Nation. Get out there and get on the air. Combine your recreational enjoyment this summer of amateur radio with the great outdoors. Join the National Parks on the Air event and celebrate our national parks turning 100 years young. 
Just be sure your ICOM equipment is ready for action. See how ICOM is changing the way receivers are being designed with ICOM's new IC7300. It will exceed expectations. RF direct sampling, 15 discrete bandpass filters, large 4.3 inch color touchscreen, real time spectrum scope, and SD memory card slot. Limited space is no problem with the IC7100 base station. It's a great compact D Star option. Angled control head and touchscreen for quick intuitive operation, large internal speaker for clear digital audio, and it's perfect for multi bands and all mode communications. Simplified operation, HF, and digital technology, the IC718 base station is the most practical rig you will ever own. Front mounted loudspeaker, DSP capability, selectable antenna tuner, and simple operation. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information on all ICOM radios. And you can tune in and enter to win after each episode of Ham Nation. Go to icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Register to win for some great swag prizes like hats and t-shirts. And while you're there, learn how you could win the monthly grand prize drawing for a new radio. And for July, that radio is going to be the ICOM ID5100A Dual Band, Dual Watch, VHF Transceiver. It's got touchscreen, it's analog and D-Star, got internal GPS, DV and FM repeater list function, available Bluetooth unit and headset, Android application, and a lot more. So go to icomamerica.com slash amateur after this and each episode of Ham Nation and register to win, icomamerica.com slash ham nation. Sign up, good luck. And don't forget to follow ICOM America, Inc. on Facebook and Twitter. And now let's go back to Bob for a moment. Uh, I, I told you I was going to go away, but I, uh, I told the guys loading the truck, uh-uh, I just got a note on my phone. Check this out, guys. This is pretty good news. Effective at the closing of the AES store on July 28th, HRO will take over the operation. They are going to uh, uh, to rebuild the Milwaukee store. And it says that that location in Milwaukee will begin an extensive remodeling project to create the largest amateur radio retail showroom in North America. Wow. We will open our newest and largest ham radio outlet in Milwaukee at the end of August 2016. So uh, that's kind of interesting news. Uh, that's a great store if you've never been there. It's huge. So uh, Robert F uh, Ferraro, who is the president of HRO, uh, sent the message, and I thought everybody should uh, should have this. I mean, you'll be hearing it tomorrow because uh, it just came onto my phone here, and I thought I'd let you know that uh, kind of a uh, the end of what uh, came across on Newsline with uh, with Don. So uh, that's what I had here. And we also want to congratulate Don. He's out with his son tonight. They're having kind of a birthday party. So we'll look for him next week. So that's it from here. And we're going to go back to Dale. And he has got a ton of beautiful, great videos. So push the button and make it happen, Dale. Tonight it is all about viewer videos of their field day. We've got six, so we'll jump right in. First in the queue is Kevin, KC7FPF, with a report on the Sun County, Florida field day. Go ahead and roll it, Brian. Field day 2016 is now in the history books. Once again, the Sun Country Amateur Radio Society participated in this year's event. For us, field day is not just being able to set up and play radio for a couple of days, but it's also a great time to gather and have some fellowship. The group powered the station by means of solar, battery, and generator power, and initial stuff setup was started on Saturday morning. Consisting of multi-band dipoles supported by push-up poles. Also included in it this year was a couple of verticals. From my understanding, the verticals worked extremely well. We worked 20, 40, and 80 phone and 20 and 15 meter CW. We even had a station work PSK from his truck.
We had quite a few people come through to see our field day set up. Some old hams and some new hams and even others that were just interested in amateur radio in general. Now, what would field day be without food? We hit, here you we go. Our host, Fred, AE2DX, did a great job grilling the hot dogs and hamburgers along with all the fixings. Besides, what does ham stand for? Have another meal. After dinner, it was back at it and into the night we went. I myself almost went all night for some finally succumbing around 3 a.m. As a tradition, on Sunday morning, we all go to breakfast for that well-deserved cup of coffee and that really good hot food. Getting back from breakfast, we operated until the end and befitting, rain started to fall early afternoon. So until next year, Kevin, KC7FPF, 7-3. Thanks, Kevin. Uh, some really nice pictures there. Next, we've got Matt. He's uh, KY4GPD. He submitted this field day video from the Gethsemane, Kentucky Amateur Radio Club. We're here with Don WC4D at the Gethsemane County, Kentucky Amateur Wireless Society. Sounds good to me. All right. And... Uh, <laughs> Tell us about your operation here for Field Day in 2016. Well, we set up three stations today. We're running three alphas to call, and the call is Kilo 4 Hotel Hotel. We have a CW station, a sideband station, and a digital station. And uh, it's just an emergency preparedness test. If we ever have anything that really needs to uh, get out and we need to set a station up quick, this is just a test to see if we can actually do it with uh, generator power, no electric power, nothing else. And uh, it's, I don't know, it's my 28th year of doing this, so I've done it quite a few times. And uh, it's an interesting thing for families and stuff to come out and see. Yeah, absolutely. And it, it, at a park location with uh, a lot of traffic, too. So you've already had some foot traffic today. Oh, yeah. I appreciate it. Thanks. That's Matt uh, with the uh, Gethsemane uh, Field Day. Now let's uh, check out field day at Cheyenne, Wyoming. KC7SNO is the call sign at the field day. The uh, videographer is uh, Tom, a regular on the 40-meter post show net, and uh, his call is WY7KY. Let's take a look. Great. This is KC7 SNO field day location. We've got one station over here that is the uh, PSK station. And Arnie was working the PSK station just a few minutes ago. And now he got over here on the service monitor and he's. What are we looking at now, Arnie? Going to look at the station over there and see what the situation is. Did I get that right? Just right. That's too easy. They call that Kilo 7 Golf. Did I get that right? Yep, I'm going to try to look at one of the stations on the air right now. 14-3. Yeah, he's not on right now. While you're looking for him, go over All here. Right, thank you, Kilo Sun Golf. All right, thank you so much. We're having a lot of fun hey. here. Uh, this is the uh, your, uh, information, please. 40 meter station. Brian KD7 RQU is uh, yeah. on. You're not the only one. <laughs> QRM, gotta love it. All right, thank you. Um, can I get your, uh, your, your report? Please? And they're working a bunch of stations. Another station it's not up right now, but it is operational. What we're having an issue like with is 40 meters and 20 meters yeah. are the only like bands that, uh, that are open right now, so we only got a couple stations on the air. And we're getting a little bit of interference between them. This is our get on the air station. This is Ron, WR80. That's uh, man in the station right now. And Getting people on the air. Faded right on, huh? And we're You're using the Whiskey Yankee 7 Kilo Yankee as the call sign. Yeah, 
Wow. Yeah. Well, so anyway, we've had some visitors today. Actually, I might have talked to you one Dylan time. and Alex. And uh, Alex has been on the air. Say hi, Alex. Hi. <laughs> and he talked to South Dakota and California today, didn't you? Yeah. Yep. Had a lot of fun. So we've had some visitors in the shack today, so it's been a good a good go to station experiment. And uh, it's working out real good. So anyway, from the KC seven SNO field day site here in uh Cheyenne, Wyoming, we got snacks and water and all kinds of stuff. So seventy three for now. That's uh, Tom Tex Ritter. Uh, we talk to him almost every week on the 40 meter post show net. So uh, we'll be talking to you in a few minutes there, uh, Tom. Let's go out to California now, the Hayward Amateur Radio Club. Uh, they're going to be next. Their video is courtesy of Alex. He's KK6ZLY. Uh, he witnessed his first field day and decided to make a video too. And your call sign one more time, please. Copy, thank you. Echo Alpha Golf, Kilowatt 6, Echo Alpha Golf. Roger, roger. We are 3 Alpha East Bay, 3 Alpha Echo Bravo. QRZ, 3 Alpha Echo Bravo, 3 Alpha Echo Bravo. Okay, well, uh, David, thanks for sharing your uh, first field day with us. And our last video tonight comes from Ham Nation Wiki editor Dan in 9 LVS. He captured the activity of the Fox Cities Amateur Radio Club. That's up in Wisconsin. Present with QR for 7, November Bravo. 
Alpha Romeo Charlie. Ski Romeo 9 Alpha Romeo Charlie, 1 Alpha Arizona. Romeo 9 Alpha Romeo Charlie, 1 Alpha Arizona. 4 Alpha Wisconsin, 4 Alpha Wisconsin. Next Wisconsin, QRZ, Wisconsin, 7 November Bravo. WR9 Alpha Romeo Charlie, 1 Alpha Arizona. Thank you, and you are 4 Alpha Wisconsin. Whiskey Romeo 9, Alpha Romeo Charlie. Whiskey Romeo 9, Alpha Romeo Charlie from 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 Whiskey Romeo 9, Alpha Romeo Charlie from
as they were mostly out of the water. The Fox City's Amateur Radio Club sees field day as more of a social event, getting together with fellow hams and making some contacts as we go along. Even though we had the rain, it was still a successful event. Seven threes from the Greenville Grange in Greenville, Wisconsin, from the Fox City's Amateur Radio Club. Okay, Dan. Well, thanks a lot for the report. We uh, r- really appreciate you maintaining the hamnationvideos.info website also. That's where you can go to find links to all of tonight's videos and actually links to all of the videos uh, shown on the video segment here on Ham Nation. Well, we received a number of field day photos also. We'll work those into a special Show Me Your Shack the next time we're on. Uh, That'll be about August 24th, I believe. Uh, Remember to uh, send your shack photos and your videos about any local amateur-related activities to Ham Nation videos at TWIT.TV. Before you edit your videos, uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd check out the guidelines at hamnationvideos.info. And George is uh, standing by now with Smoke and Solder, and he has a video from Randy, K7AGE. But first, we need to check in with Don and find out what's new at DX Engineering. Let's talk antenna maintenance. Maybe uh, you need to repair. Maybe you need to upgrade. Maybe you just want to replace the whole thing. Well, get out there and do it during the summer. Yeah, you'll have to fight bugs and uh, sunburn and humidity and things like that, but it means you'll be able to spend the cold winter months inside on the air instead of outside on the tower. That is not safe, and it's not fun, and that's where DX Engineering comes in. They offer plenty of solutions for your antenna insulation challenges, be they technical or environmental, and there's a trio of robust antennas just ideal for the HF operator who may be short on space but doesn't want to compromise on performance. The RF Pro 1B Active Magnetic Loop Antenna now made exclusively and sold exclusively by DX Engineering. Here's the cool thing. covers all the HF bands 160 to 10 meters. It has deep nulls. You can rotate it to ward off any interfering signals and directional noise. In fact, it offers up to 30 dB of rejection. comes with an ultra low noise preamp, and it's strictly a receive-only antenna. The cool thing is because it's an active magnetic loop, it's about the same size as a hula hoop. You can put it up on a rotator, a little rotator. You're going to love this antenna. Also, DX Engineering has just purchased TW antennas. That's the famous Trans World antenna. It will continue to be available to the ham community, and DX Engineering is seeing to that. This antenna and the related components will remain virtually unchanged from the original design specs. I mean, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? The Trans World antenna is essentially a single structure with interchangeable array box center sections that are available separately for the bands you want to operate on. There are options for monoband 80, 40, or 30-meter operation or multiband operation on all three. And DX Engineering will also make all of the Transworld antenna accessories, including the Quadra Stand, the Travel Bag, and Mounting Assembly. Now we go to Bushcom's Highlander 8. This is an amazing emergency and portable duty antenna. It performs so well in mobile, base, and marine applications, too. It is an 80 to 6-meter whip. It will handle up to 250 watts PEP. It even provides coverage on the work bands. It's a carefully coiled antenna wire on a fiberglass mast, and that keeps the height under six feet. You change the bands by plugging into another tap on the antenna. It uses a standard 3 8 by 24 mount, so if you're going to use it mobile, you need to use a heavy-duty base and springs so you don't tear that thing off, and uh, you want to keep it around because it's a great antenna. All these are available at DX Engineering, plus a whole lot more. And you know DX Engineering ships faster than anybody else in the industry. Get your order in by 10 p.m. tonight, Eastern Time. And if it's in stock, it'll be on a trek headed your way tonight. And most orders over 99 bucks are eligible for free standard shipping. Proven products, expert advice, DX Engineering helps you shrink the globe. Request your catalog. You're going to love that. Shop online 24-7, 365 at dxengineering.com slash hamnation. dxengineering.com slash hamnation. Thanks, DX Engineering. We appreciate it. Your support of Ham Nation. Well, thank you, Don. That is some nice-looking antennas there. That Bushcom, I've never seen that before, but it looks an awful lot like an Outbacker, so I, I kind of wonder if it's uh, not a descendant of it. We'll have to find out more about that one. Well, we've got a video tonight. You know, Randy built Bob's mixer a while back, and uh, he's 
Well, he's in the process of moving, so he's got a lot going on. He's building a house, too. So he finally did get around, though, to connecting it up and checking it out. And that's what we're going to look at this week. Hello, Randy, K7AGE. I'm back. And now we will hook up the mixer. So I'm not going to use my mixer for transmit audio. I'm not going to hook up a microphone into the mixer and the output of the mixer go into my HF radio. I'm only going to be using this for receiving. So for receiving, I have four audio sources I will be connecting into the mixer. My Elecraft K3, my Kenwood TS2000, which has a main and a sub receiver. So on the main, I can have HF typically, and on the sub, I can have either 2 meter or 450, or a lot of times I use it to monitor two different 2 meter repeaters here in the area. And my fourth source will be my Uniden Home Patrol scanner. So the output of the mixer is going to be connected to a pair of JBL powered speakers. So these will sound a lot better than the little speakers that are in the radio and also better than the quote matching speakers that uh, all the manufacturers sell. And with the mixer I can mix any of the four sources to either of the two speakers. So I have a lot of control over what I hear coming out of each speaker. So to control the audio with the mixer we have the sliders which affects the gain and we very important is the pan pots. And the pan pots adjust in proportion the input to the two outputs. So if I have the pan pot all the way to the left, the input will come out the left speaker. If I have another input set with the pan pot all the way to the right, it'll come out the right speaker. If I put it in the middle, it'll come out both speakers. So this is one of the ways you can control what audio will come out which speaker. So I've made a cable list here of all the cables that I need to connect the radios to the mixer. So for the microphone, it would be for an XLR microphone for, for video recording. So it just needs a um, male to female cable to go between the mic and the mixer. The K3 will use a 3.5 millimeter stereo plug on one end to a male XLR on the other. The TS2000, the main output, is an RCA on my audio breakout box. It'll go to a, another male XLR to plug into the mixer. Same thing for the sub-receiver output, the S, another RCA to male XLR. And the scanner uses a 2.5 millimeter, and I'll connect that to a quarter-inch um, connector on the mixer, which has three circuits, tip, ring, and, and sleeve. Wiring up to the mixer requires that we're going to be dealing with two, two different styles of audio wiring. What's in the radios is known as unbalanced. This is very simple. There's a hot wire, which is typically the center, kind of like a coax, and another wire, which is the ground or the shield. So just two wires, and the signal's carried between the hot and the, and the shield. The mixer uses what's called balance wiring. So now it's three conductors instead of two. There's two conductors that carry the signal. There's a hot and a cold or a plus and minus, however you want to call them. These two wires are twisted, a twisted pair. The third wire is the, the shield or the ground that goes around them. Now the audio or the signal is carried as the difference between these two signals. So this would typically go into an op amp which has a plus and minus input. The difference is then amplified. The reason balance wiring is preferred for professional audio is that any noise that would get introduced into the wiring gets introduced into both of the conductors equally. And since we're looking at the difference in the signal to be amplified, if it's the same signal on each wire, it's basically canceled out and only the difference between the two wires is amplified. So this is really preferred for professional audio. So to wire into the mixer, we'll be using unbalanced sources to a balanced input on the mixer. So we'll take the, the hot lead of the unbalanced wire. It'll connect to pin two on the XLR. This is the, the hot or the plus terminal. The shield will connect to pin three, which is the ground or shield, and also to the minus or the cold side. So now the amplifier in the mixer will 
amplify the difference between one pins one and two and one's actually also connected to three. So this is how you go from an unbalanced to a balanced using an XLR connector. The mixer also uses quarter inch connectors that are three circuits. So there's what's called the sleeve, the ring, or the tip, or you may hear people call it tip ring sleeve or TRS. So there's three signals, there are three connections here just like on the XLR connection. So the tip is the plus, the ring would be the minus, equivalent to an XLR, and the shield is equal to pin three on, on the XLR. So the hot lead from the unbalance will come in and connect to the tip, and the shield will connect both to the sleeve and also the ring connector on the plug that will be plugged into the mixer. So that's how that'll be wired. So for the cabling, I bought a a bunch of XLR extension cables from somewhere on Amazon, I forget where, but these are about six feet long. They come with both the male and the female XLR connectors pre-soldered. These are twisted pairs, so there's two wires plus the shield. So I'm gonna be soldering the pins one and three together, or the wires for pins one and three together at the connector I install, so I don't have to open these up and do the jumper inside the connector. Okay. Time for some smoke and solder. I have some cables oops, and some connectors, so let's get busy. Well, I got all those connectors soldered on. Now I have a lot of cables. So let's hook them up between the radio and the mixer. Here we go. Okay, we got all the cables hooked up from the radios to the mixer. Now let's get the speakers out and set those up on the shelf here. Okay, I've got it all installed here. I have the mixer pulled out a little bit so we can see things. I have the K3, let me turn up the monitor volume. It turns up the feed to the speakers. That's the K3 on the, on the second input. I have my TS2000 main on the third input. So I open the squelch, I have that coming out of this speaker, the pan pot to the left. If I open up the squelch on the sub receiver, it comes out on the right speaker and the scanner here is also set to come out over on the right speaker. So I think I'm pretty well set up. Okay, I've got the mixer all installed here. Everything seems to be working, and I just now need to spend some time with it to play around with the levels and the pans and the EQ to get things tweaked in just the way I want. But I'm sure this is gonna be a very nice addition to the shack, having these nice JBL speakers. So thanks for watching. This is Randy, K7AGE. Well, great information there, Randy. Uh, a mixer can make a lot of difference. Uh, some way to do a little bit of EQ on what you're receiving there. And a good set of speakers, too. And I think the key was the last thing Randy said there, is he was going to take some time to adjust everything and get it to sound the way that he wanted it to sound. And, you know, that's, that's the key right there. Make it sound like what you want it to sound like. There's no set rules. I mean, it's it's all up to your ear in the end since you'll be the only one listening to it. And uh, whatever works the best in your situation is, uh, is what's right for you. Well, we looked at all those field day videos earlier, and I had one last week. I showed you the antennas that uh, we used at field day this year. Well, we've posted that episode now if you'd like to go out and uh, – and see everything that uh, Tommy and I and uh, our friends Wayne and Vince did at Field Day this year. That's over at AmateurLogic.tv. Just posted that in the last day or so. So uh, check that out. We had a lot of fun. 
Now, I've got some things to give away here tonight. You know, my question last week may not have been my um, my clearest question ever <laughs> because only about uh, less than 5% of you got the answer correct on it or what I was looking for is the correct answer. My question was, what was the wavelength of the vertical antenna I built for Phil Day? And um, people were answering 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. And most everybody said that. Well, that was the bands that, um, you know, my antenna was supposed to work on. But what I was looking for was actually uh, the wavelength of each of those on that vertical antenna. It's a quarter wavelength antenna. So uh, we did have uh, a few people get it right. And among those, I drew a random number, and the winner was Marvin Haynes, WB4OKM. And he said it was a quarter wavelength, and he didn't beat around the bush. He just put it out there, as did the other few people who <laughs> gave me the uh, answer I was looking for on that one. So congratulations, Marvin. We're going to give you this MFJ148RC dual 12, 24-hour large digit clock with um, radio control time sync and a built-in 10-minute ID timer. And yes, I accidentally hit that button last week and we heard the ID timer. I, I won't do that this week. So uh, congratulations, Marvin. MFJ will be sending you one of those. For next week, I've got another DX engineering cap uh, just for one of you. If you'd like to win this, well, then answer this question from the amateur radio technician exam. Which of the following types of feed line has the lowest loss at VHF and UHF? Uh, your choices are A, 50 ohm flexible coax, B, multi-conductor unbalanced cable, C, air insulated hard line, or D, 75 ohm flexible cable. So if you think you know the answer to that, Send your answer to me, hamnationcontest at gmail.com, and you could win this DX engineering cap. And now let's get Amanda in here and see what's been going on in the chat room tonight. Well, good evening, George. And my first announcement is I didn't announce something last week that I should have. So let me get to that first. Um, NY2MC Mickey, he'd like to announce that his son, Alex, who's 12 years old, just got his tech ticket and his call sign is KD2LJJ. So congratulations, Alex. I'm sorry I missed that last week and uh, can't wait to hear you on the air. Uh, next, I'm going to go over what I've been doing this week. Uh, obviously, a big fire came around Canyon City, not really Canyon City. It's about 30 miles west of us. And um, Brian, if you want to go to the website first. Okay, if you scroll down, we can see the live smoke plume. Now this is from our repeater site here. Oh, you don't have to play that one. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that shot right there. Oh, that looks wow. Like, that looks like clouds, but that is all smoke. And um, earlier, actually, it was just huge stacks of smoke plumes. Now, Gordo, you know this as well, because you've gone to a lot of fires. And this time of evening, it's when it starts to lay down. So it, it is laying down right now because the humidity picks up a little bit. And uh, that helps. That always helps. And then they always hope that there's no wind so that they can put some more air support in there to uh, drop some more slurry to save houses, things like that. Um, let me show you some of the other pictures I got, though. We've been activated. Aries is activated right now. Um, we've been uh, doing travel for the Fremont County Sheriff's Office and we're doing, um, we're, help, we're handling the traffic for evacuation. So this is the first picture I got sent on Sunday afternoon. That's about, that's the second picture I got sent on Sunday afternoon. It just blew up. This came from a lightning strike on Friday afternoon and um, they went out there, checked it, no smoke. So they just let it do its thing. And uh, Sunday, the humidity dropped to about 10%. The winds picked up and boom. There it was. Went from 1,000 acres to about um, 13,000 now in four days. Now, these guys are just going over their first uh, daily briefing, which we were standing around for as well. And, um, yeah, I'm just, 
I just kind of threw, this is where we were operating from actually, or where we are currently operating from Cotopaxi, Colorado. And uh, just seeing those uh, smoke clouds come right over you and dropping ash on you. It's pretty crazy. This was my trip to go pick up lunch for us yesterday. Pretty interesting that you have to drive by all of that to go get your lunch from the, the Red Cross shelter. Now this is us. This is funny, you guys. Our substation, that's where we were operating from. Um, it has nothing. It's just like a little shed and it has a desk and it has a toilet in it. So there's about 25 people hanging around here. And so we're operating out of an old ambulance and they have a DTR radio in there and um, VHF listening to the air to ground um, frequencies. And that's a close up view of the radios that we were actually using out there in the ambulance. Um, pretty interesting. So what we decided was, hey, we've got a cool van with amateur radio and DTR and uh, all the other frequency we frequencies we need. Why don't we bring that along? So we brought our van and it has AC. So, hey, that's kind of nice. Uh, so we parked it right next to the ambulance and we kind of had a back and forth so we could have more operators actually in there. And that's Jeff just setting up some of the um, antennas. We, we brought along satellite internet because there's absolutely no phone service there if you use Verizon. If you have AT&T, you're okay. So, um, Anyhow, just a couple more um, statistics for you. Let me see. I have some written down here. Don't worry. I'll be right with you. There's about 150 homes evacuated and only one structure lost so far. Uh, they are predicting more evacuations, and this is spreading to two counties, and that, gets, that makes things tricky. And now they're going to start opening some more um, Red Cross shelters if there are more evacuations. Therefore, not only do I have to worry about manning for the sheriff's office, I now have to worry about manning the shelter. So uh, it's now a complete joint Colorado Aries um, deployment instead of just my district. And um, another thing I want to talk about, you guys, with Aries, it's not all about ham radio. How you can help is using a radio. These guys need to be out in the field because that's what they're qualified to do. A lot of them have their red cards, whereas we don't, we can't go out there and help evacuate people. So we should always be volunteering to help however we can. And one of those ways is to just sit there, take their traffic, and it doesn't have to be ham radio. It can be the DTR system, whatever. As long as they're okay with it and you have a mutual agreement, it's absolutely no problem. So there you go. That's what I'm doing. And I'll be doing it again tomorrow morning, starting at 530. So it's been a long week already. <laughs> Anyhow, you guys, I do have some questions as well. Um, the first one, Gordo, I'm going to send to you. Uh, Travis, KA7TZX, says he needs a little bit of help. He has a CR8900A on the hood of his 2011 Kia Soul, and 10 meters won't go below a 3 to 1 SWR. 6 meters and 2 meters are at 1.4 or less. Ground straps on both sides of the hood to the chassis. Any ideas? And uh, by the way, he's running a TH9800. Take it away, Gordo. Well, if the 10 meter band is not loading, but it takes a dip at 28.3 or 28.4, Amanda, likely it's a feed point impedance problem and DX engineering as well as MFJ have impedance matchers. And that very well could get that antenna to play much better with a lower SWR on 10 meters. And Amanda, congratulations to all the hard work that you and your team and Jeff are putting in on supporting communications during this big fire. Well, thank you. Jeff is calling me right now, probably an emergency, but I'm going to ignore it for just a minute. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Um, one, and thank you so much, Gordo. It is a lot of hard work. And I'll tell you that after FEMA came in and... Um, put in ICS forms, all of a sudden your work has quadrupled because you have so much paperwork when you do the assignments and scheduling. So think think hard. If you're gonna, if you're ever offered an emergency coordinator job, think about it and make sure you really want to dedicate that time because it takes a lot of time. And I'm just exactly <laughs> I'm very fortunate that my parents are pretty cool about I can do this stuff at work and I can leave work to go do it. So um okay. Next thing, um, this is going to be for you, George. And um, this one kind of baffled me a little bit. I don't know that it exists, but we'll see. 
Does anyone make a two meter, 10 meter duplexer? I'm guessing, is that even possible? Um, yeah, well, it theoretically, yeah, it's possible whether or not you'd actually want one. I I don't know that you've got an antenna that's easily going to cover two meters and 10 meters. I could be wrong about that, but I don't recall ever seeing it. Do you, Gordo? No, um, I'm with you, George. I'd much rather see the HF up to 10 meters, maybe even six meters fed to one antenna designed for that and then the two meter 440 on the other end, channel port. Yep. Okay, not only that, but where would you store that 10 meter duplexer? How big would that be, George? I wouldn't have to be super big. I mean, it, it could be, um, yeah, it, it could be not so big. Like coffee can size? Or are we talking 55 gallon barrel size? Oh, no, no, you, you could do it coffee can size for- really? uh, Okay. For what we do, I mean, you know, for a repeater or something, you're you're talking about uh, big cavities and all. But most of the time, uh, our ham duplexers for mobile use are, are fairly compact. All right, that's that's interesting enough. Sorry, you guys. DTR still has traffic going on here, so I'm probably going to have to step away and monitor. But um, that's really all the questions I had. Uh, uh, let's just go over the nets really quick. 14,287 on 20 meters and 7,202 on 40 meters. So that's what I have. Thanks, everyone. Over to you, George. I think you're wrapping it up here. Okay, Amanda. Well, I'm glad that you had a few minutes you could get in with us tonight. I can tell you and Jeff have really been working hard there in the whole team. And uh, just good luck and Godspeed on... Uh, getting that fire under control. You know, I, I don't know a lot about that type of thing. We have a few forest fires here, but nothing like y'all have out west there. So uh, good luck with that one. And uh, hopefully that'll be under control soon. And we'll see you back here next week. Well, let's uh, take one more round with everybody before we say good night. Uh, Gordo, any final words from Costa Mesa tonight? Yep, everything is fine here, and I hear signals uh, coming through on uh, 7202, so we'll take a listen. And uh, for those in the chat room that ever want to get a hold of me, my call sign WB6NOA at ARRL.net, and I will be happy to answer any uh, sort of techie questions that you might have, especially on HF antennas and VHF, UHF. And by the way, the Hawaiian beacon uh, poked its head back in a couple of days ago. So we still have propagation on VHF, UHF, 2,500 miles from here to Hawaii. Wow. Back to you, George. Boy, that that uh, that sounds nice there. And there have uh, been a lot of uh, uh, ducting openings going on through the south here recently. I've heard some myself and heard of some incredible skip going on there. So uh, keep an eye on that too for uh, those of you in the rest of the country. Uh, Dale, any final words from you? Oh, just uh, just a couple, George. Uh, uh, probably won't be back on till sort of late August. So I thought I'd do a plug right now for a uh, an event uh, coming up in late August. Uh, that would be uh, the uh, Kansas CUSO party. And uh, just got my uh, certificate and stamps in from Bob Harder uh, during the last month. Uh, so that's about the fourth weekend, uh, third to fourth weekend in uh, August. And it's a lot of fun. We uh, have been licensed already for W0U operation. Again, that's the U in Sunflower. So I look forward to working everybody there. Uh, otherwise, we'll be traveling here for a couple of three weeks. So uh, uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to watch the show on the road and uh, hope everybody has a good week here in front of us. Uh, George, good night. Uh, good night to you and uh, good to have you back with us tonight and uh, have a good trip there. Uh, some great field day videos, by the way. Thanks to all those who sent those in to us. That, that was fun watching it and seeing how different people handle field deer every year. Well, a little earlier, Amanda gave us the uh, HF net frequencies. If you're on Echo Link, uh, you can catch the net at uh, star do drop in star or node number 355800. 
If you're on D-Star, you can go to Reflector 14, Module C, and catch the net there. So thanks for being here with us, everybody. Bob, I believe, will be back with us next week, although he had to step out a little early tonight to pack up his gear to uh, to get on the road there to, to West Shum's event. So uh, 7-3, and join us again next week.